Oh Sheva, Israel National TV, and Or Olam, the Center for Biblical Zionism, present Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel. The Torah shall come forth from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. That was one of the phrases that I guess inspired Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem. I think it's one of the most famous phrases in all of the Tanakh. You know, it's written on synagogues across the world. It's written on every other Torah scroll. But what's interesting about that passage is that it's actually the last half of an entire sentence. And when you read that sentence in its entirety, you actually see that the Torah from Israel is supposed to go out to someone. It's not just going out, but it's going out to someone in particular. In fact, it says, amim rabim. Many nations will go and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of Hashem, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his path. For the Torah shall come forth from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. So who's the Torah supposed to go out to? Well, it's not supposed to go out to the Jews in Muncie. The Torah from Israel is supposed to go out to the nations of the world. God chose the Jewish people for a very special task, a very unique task, a daunting task. He chose us to be a light to inspire the entire world. And that's why tonight's show is dedicated to understanding what it means to be a light unto the nations. Avram Avinu. Yeah, the first Jew, the father of all Jews. You know, he was chosen for that same mission. He didn't just have to teach his children about God, but he and Sarah went around the world. Every person they came across, every king they encountered, they brought these Torah principles to the entire world with a mission of shifting global consciousness. They wanted to bring a God consciousness to the world. And embedded in every single one of us, in our spiritual DNA, we have this spiritual revolutionary inside of us that knows that we can change the entire world. Now, throughout the exile, the Jewish people had just one thing in mind was Jewish survival. We went from country to country, exile to exile, expulsion to expulsion, trying to keep the flame of Torah alive, passing our heritage from generation to generation, knowing that one day God would have mercy on us, shine his light on his people and bring us back home. But today, now that we're back in the land of Israel, a shift needs to happen to us. And we need to realize that we're here to change the world and a new Jewish voice needs to leave Israel a Jewish voice, a faith-based voice, a Torah voice needs to come out of Zion and light up the entire world. Now, there's a famous joke. There's a famous joke about a Jewish man that, God forbid, he decides to convert to Christianity. God forbid, it's just a joke. Tovia Singer, the rabbi, was nowhere to be found. So, he goes through the whole shtick, goes through the process, and he's asked to, afterwards, speak to his new congregation. So he walks up, stands in front of the podium, clears his voice, fixes his collar, 
and starts announcing to the room, Good morning, my fellow Goyim. <laughs> you see, only the Jewish people, who are one-tenth of one percent of the entire world's population, would have a name for all the other people in the world, the other 99% of the world. Only the Jewish people in that word is Goyim, which literally means nations. And I believe the reason for that is because we understand that we are a separate and a different people. And we have a task and a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the nations of the world. You know, the Torah begins with Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the rabbis ask a question. If the Torah is an instruction manual for the Jewish people, then why doesn't it begin with a mitzvah for the Jewish people, a commandment for the Jewish people? Rav Yoel Schwartz, a great rabbi here in Jerusalem, says that the question itself is misleading. The Torah is not a guideline and instructions solely for the Jewish people, but for the entire world. You see, the Jewish people need to keep 613 commandments, beautiful treasures that God has given us. And the nations of the world are commanded to keep seven laws. And these are the seven laws of Noah, which guarantee an elevated and beautiful society. And for every non-Jew that keeps these seven laws, because God commanded it in the Torah, they're fulfilling God's will and merit the world to come. Now, Maimonides explains in Sefer HaMitzvot, the book of mitzvot, of commandments, that part of the mitzvah, part of the commandment of truly loving God is sharing our knowledge of God, like our father Abraham, with the entire world. It's our responsibility, and the Midrash warns us that if we do not fulfill that task and that responsibility, then the punishment of the nations for not doing their job because we haven't taught them, their punishment is to a large degree on us. We are to blame. We are to blame. Does that make sense? Why would we be the blame of what the nations do to us? Ruff Cook explains that every nation that rose to power throughout history had a message it needed to bring the world. It needed to impact the world in a way that only it could. The Romans, the Babylonians, the Greeks, all rose to power, affected the world, and then faded into history. The nation of Israel is the only nation in the world that's lasted through the test of time. And Rav Cook explains the reason why we're still here is because the world hasn't heard our message yet. Now, if there was ever a time that the world was ready to hear our message, it's now. The entire world's eyes are constantly on Israel. CNN and BBC, the New York Times. Israel makes international headlines every day. Now, why are we to blame? We're to blame because when we talk about Israel and we talk about Judaism, we begin to stutter. As the Arabs claim so confidently that the Jewish people stole their land, that the entire state of Israel is one big settlement, that we've stolen their land that belonged to them for generations, when the cameras focus on our Jewish leaders, we hear stuttering half-sentences full of apologies, quoting UN resolutions and Balfour declarations and ceasefire treaties. We're to blame because when we talk about Israel, we don't tell the world the truth. And it's time that the world knows the truth. That we're not in Israel because of the UN, and we're not in Israel because of Balfour Declaration. We're in Israel because there's a God in the world. We, the Jewish people, are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God promised the land of Israel to us as an everlasting inheritance. And until we share that with the world, the world will never understand. We're not here as a result of the Holocaust. We're here because finally after 2,000 years, God has brought us back to the land of Israel and he's fulfilling his promise that he promised to our people in the Bible over 70 times. Over 70 times God promised that he would gather the exiles from the four corners of the earth and today our lives in Israel are living that promise. Our job today is to know, tell the world that after 2,000 years, the Jewish people are back in Jerusalem. And now that we're home, we're never going to leave. So last week, Jeremy and I decided to go to the old city, 
the holiest place in the holiest city of the whole world. And we were going around speaking to some of the most interesting, incredible, wise characters just wandering the streets. And we wanted to find out from them, in their minds, what it means for the Jewish people to be a light unto the nations. So we want you to meet the streets of Jerusalem. And now, meet the street with Ari and Jeremy. <laughs> What light do you think Judaism has brought to the world? We are light unto the nations. We have to set an example to show the other nations. I think it's brought every light that exists today. Kindness, goodness, morals, values, Ten Commandments. When we have lived according to the Torah, we, I think we've been a light to the nations. The optimum would be Jews being the language of God just like God intended for them to be. But God says in Ezekiel, even if you're not worthy, even if you don't believe in me, I'm still going to use you. And so we become a light unto the nations. In spite of ourselves, God uses us rather than we fulfilling our own potential. And God brings us back into the land of Israel. God brings us out of the ovens of Auschwitz. God uses us to make a desert land grow. That shakes the world up. Judaism has taught the world morals and ethics and how to, how to run daily life, how to be a good person, how to help other people out. We're supposed to give example to all the world in manners of how to, how to act, how to behave between friends, family. We have to teach all the world how to behave, how to act. It's not about teaching the world, it's about us acting as true servants of Hashem. Will teach the world in itself. Show the nations, not just tell the nations by word. Our words going to follow our actions. So for us to be that light is when we screw that bulb in the base and we're here and there to say it and we're, we've got the house built, the light will shine. I think there's too much hate in the world today, uh, conflicting religions, all that kind of stuff. And so as a Jew, I think it's my obligation um, to shine light on those issues and sort of change them uh, and show that we shall live in harmony with each other and be peaceful and there's no need for a lot of the stuff that goes on today. I would like to see Israel and its leaders talk about being Jewish. We need to be proud of being Jewish. We need to be proud of our history. We need to counteract those who have tried to distort our history. What light do you feel most grateful that the Jewish people have brought already to the world? Their love um, of family, their love of the land, um, they honor their God. So as a non-Jew, what would you like to hear the Jewish people out of Israel proclaim and say to the whole world? I think submit to, to, to Torah and Tanakh. You know, God chose the Jewish people. Whether we like it or not, Goyim. But I admit, I, I came to the conclusion, yes, he did. You know, let's read, let's read Torah and Tanakh. Nations go around saying, I don't get these people. They should have been gone, they should have been destroyed, they should have been obliterated, they should have been replaced. And yet God's using them. There's something here I need to understand. What do we have to teach them about God? Uh, that there's one God and uh, most central part of, of human existence. Hashem intends us to be a tool to reveal himself in this world. Not that he's up there, we're down here, we have nothing to do with him. He intends to use us and by us allowing ourselves to be used, God's name is revealed in the ultimate sense. We are the chosen nation, the chosen one. We are the sons of the God. Hashem, he choose, he choose you. So I'm happy, I'm happy to submit. You know, I accept that. What does that do for us, that God is in every aspect of our life? How does that change your life? It elevates everything to an entirely different plane. And it infuses meaning into every realm. And also allows you never to feel alone at any point or anywhere that you are. We are a Torah people. We are Sem a Semitic people. We are tribal people. We are a separate people. And part of, the, uh, part of being a light to the nations, you can't really be a, a light to others unless you have enough separation from the others. So how are you guys being a light in South Africa? Practice Judaism, try to teach people what our culture is about. Judaism is um, it's a fantastic way of living. Um, once you start getting into it, 
Like, I'm not a very religious guy in South Africa, but when I come here, I love wearing my yarmulke, I love speaking Hebrew and just living the way of an Israeli, and I think it's great. What does Torah teach us? Not to be angry, not to be angry, not to be angry, not to be angry, not to be angry. So if you had one thing, one message you would want to tell the whole world about Israel that they never see, what would it be? That they should come here because it's fun and cool. This is a chosen land for the Jewish people and we're going to keep living here. Israel is a fantastic place. I would live here if I could. And people come visit, really, it's fantastic. Israel's uh, definitely made me see the world in a broader perspective. Israel is just the center of the world. It is cer certainly the center of the world and it has been a blessing for me to come here to Israel. Every house you see being built in this land and every Holocaust survivor reinstituting a family and growing children and grandchildren and allowing those grandchildren to actually go into the army and protect this country, that's a message of hope and unenduring faith that gives hope to a world that right now is very lost because they don't have a sense of future, they don't have a sense of where they're going. This people have never lost that sense. What have you learned about Israel in your first time? Uh, I came here to learn about other stuff, security. Why have you come to Israel to learn security? Where else would you go? And what do you plan on bringing back to the people of Kenya to teach them what you've learned here in Jerusalem? It's a secret. It's a secret. I'm loving it. I feel Jewish already. If we actually stopped and look at where we've been and where we are and where we're going, um, the message that we bring to the world is, is a, a, a shining beacon. My name is Rahamim. Rahamim! Rahamim means compassion in Hebrew. Yeah. Rahamim, Mr. Compassion, where were you born? I born in Bombay, in India. If you were a light bulb, would you be a super bright light bulb? or sort of one of those red light bulbs that you go into discotheques and dance to? Oh, it's so, not so, it's okay. A discotheque light bulb? Yes, that's fine for If you were a light bulb yourself, what voltage do you think you would be? Thousand. A thousand fluorescent? <laughs> Japan has brought ninja and kung fu. What has the Jewish people brought? Uh, cool. Is it good to see the Jewish people back in Jerusalem? <laughs> Osaka. 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 Matsuyama. Oh. Yeah. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom and welcome back to Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem. Tonight we have a special guest. We have a man who exemplifies what it means to be a light unto the nations. On Israel National Radio, back at home, he's known as the chief rabbi of talk radio. He's the director of outreach Judaism and a world expert counter-missionary. See, there's a spiritual movement that's happening now around the world. It's unprecedented in world history. It's called Christian Zionism. And a lot of Jews are very confused by what this means for centuries upon centuries. All we've known of the Christian world is crusades, pogroms, and holocausts. And all of a sudden, we see Christians marching for Israel, lobbying in Washington for Israel. And a lot of Jews are very skeptical of this Christian support for Israel. And the truth is rightfully so. Because with this wonderful support for Israel, today there are more Christian missionaries and Jew for Jesus activists than ever in the history of Israel. And Tovia Singer, Rabbi Tovia Singer, is here to tell us, to guide us as a rabbi and as a mentor, how we are to engage with the Christian world and protect our people from insidious efforts of these missionaries to destroy our people from within. So please give a warm round of applause for a man who has dedicated his entire life to saving Jewish souls, Rabbi Tovia Singer. All right, so this is the first question. First of all, explain to us what this movement of Christian Zionism is. How did it start and how dangerous or how good is it to us or for us? In the 19th century, a new theology swept the Christian world. It emerged out of England that would ultimately produce the Belfort Declaration you alluded to earlier. It's called premillennial dispensationalism. Now, what that actually means, 
What that actually means is that God has a permanent covenant with the Jewish people. Christians discovered, both in England and throughout North America, that the covenant that God made with the children of Israel was permanent. Not only that, that this land belongs to the Jewish people. We knew that, the church didn't. Now, as this is happening at the same time that the Vilna Gaon sends students here to the land of Israel to begin a messianic age. And these fundamentalist Christians that are all over this land, they believe that this land belongs to the Jewish people and no other. They believe that God has a covenant with the children of Israel, can never be broken. It was sealed in heaven. It can never be undone. So what happened in 1948 had to have flipped them out. It, it, for them, it, two things happened. Among those Christians who are Christian Zionists, they said, my Lord, the Bible is unfolding before our eyes. To the Catholic Church, to the Greek Orthodox Church, this was a nightmare. I mean, to them, they were looking at all the church fathers, Augustine, Justin, all of them said the Jews would never return to this land. Justin I mean, said that? Yes, Justin <laughs> said that. Okay. When the Pope came to Israel, back in March of the year 2000. Do you think that the Catholic Church ever imagined thousands of years ago that the Jewish people were returned to this land in spite of what the Christian Bible says, in spite of what the Church Fathers said? It shocked them. So in the Catholic Church, in those who teach replacement theology, there was shock and revulsion. They wouldn't accept it. In 67, that was a stunner for them because they assumed that, look, as long as the Jews don't have Jerusalem, that's no problem. But God wrought forth a miracle for our nation. In the early part of June, Dayan didn't want the old city. He told the saints, stay out. But God had a different plan. However, the Christian Zionists, they were going, oh my gosh, the Jews have returned to their land. So we're dealing with two different mouths of the church, and the, the impact it's having on this country is staggering. And in that way... It's entirely positive. So in what way is it negative? What are the dangers of this Christian support or the Catholic hatred? The problem is this, that the same fundamentalist Christians who believe that this land, this wall, it belongs to the Jewish people, they believe that the Jews have to be converted to the cross, that each and every one of you needs to be baptized. You, young lady, you need to accept the blood of Jesus tonight. I'm just kidding. We're just, we're just talking for the program. <laughs> <laughs> they believe in fact in the book of Matthew chapter 10 it says there go to the go to the Jew don't even bother with the Gentile moreover these fundamentalist Christians we're not talking about liberals here we're not discussing a uh, Presbyterians who are passing resolutions to in fact economically boycott this country we're talking about the most evangelical Christians they believe Based on a verse at the end of the book of Matthew, it's Matthew 23. It's, a, it's unfortunately a horribly anti-Semitic chapter. The last verse, Jesus is supposedly speaking, and he says, I will not return unless you say, blesses is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Because that chapter, when Jesus, he's speaking to a Jewish audience, the church historically understands it to mean one thing. It means that Jesus can't make a second coming unless you accept the cross in your heart. And I'm going to pray for you. So what's happening right now in Israel? They believe we're in the end times now. They're watching Iran pointing its, Scud, its, its Shahab 3 missiles in this country. They believe that the second coming of Jesus can't happen unless you, Jeremy, unless you, Ari, accept the cross. It's a very serious problem because we're, we, it's not a pure situation. We can say, hey, you're supporting Israel. But you know what? You're also supporting Jews for Jesus. These missionaries tragically come to this country. You guys were in Sedora reaching out to our brothers who are, who are under rocket fire from Hamas. Hamas is not trying to destroy our soul. They're trying to destroy our body. They actually, the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America, they got a group called Project Joseph. So they figure out, okay, Jews are under, you know, under this Scud missile, attack, some rocket attack every day because of a failed policy in the Knesset. Let's send missionaries down to Siddur Road. Let's hit the Jews who are most vulnerable at a time of need. Like, let's set up soup kitchens and stuff like that to evangelize and convert the Jews to the church. And that's why, but I want to make this very clear because I know for some of you this is, this concerns you deeply. I want you to know this. Listen like you've never listened in your life. Although the leaders of Jews for Jesus, 
Although those folks who run that church inside of Jaffa K called Emmanuel, it was built in the old city of Jerusalem when Jews started to pour into Yerushalayim. It was built in about 1857. Although the leadership of the Assemblies of God, although those who are in front of the largest Christian Protestant denomination in America, the Southern Baptist Convention, we're talking about more than 40,000 churches in the United States. Although the leadership wants to convert you and they are, you won't be able to change them, something was wonderful is happening in this country. And that is the Gentiles, the plain folks who are coming here. They're excited about being in Israel. They hear folks like you quoting the book of Isaiah. They see Jewish people who don't walk around with the New York Times but walk around with the Tanakh. They see Jewish folks who aren't supporting the ACLU and the UCLA, but they're supporting the words of Zechariah. They see Jewish people in Bethel, in Hebron, and I met a couple of folks here who moved to Hebron back there, that are standing at the forefront, at the, standing up against the enemy, protecting Israel, and thereby protecting America. And they say, my gosh, Obviously, the Lord is with you. There's something happening now. Although we're not there yet, Zechariah 8.23 is beginning to unfold. Ten Gentiles are grabbing the shirt of a Jew and saying, take us with you because now we know that God is with you. So that's a marvelous thing that's happening in this country. We're actually folks who are not Jewish. I got this thought in my mind. I'm not sure if it's true, and when Elijah comes, I'll figure it out. I believe many of these righteous Gentiles who are coming to the Jewish people want to learn more about the Jewish faith. They are distinct are imposter Gentiles. A secret was taken to the grave hundreds of years ago. You read that email. And these folks, these are, many of them, I believe, are Jewish souls cleaving, clawing their way, coming close. And by the way, to every all of you, God bless you. I, I just made Aliyah three months ago. Three months ago. And when I, when I, I love these guys. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I look at it, I, I, I made Aliyah. I, I just, can I do this for one, sure. one second? I was reporting, I do news talk radio on Arocheva. I was reporting the news and reported that eight of my brothers were murdered in Merkaz Arav. I went off here at 12 o'clock at night in, in, in New York, and I got a phone call at 1 o'clock in the morning. 1 o'clock in the morning, I got a call that a home is available to you in the Jewish quarter of the old city. I said, I'll take it. I called up Continental Airlines. I'm a platinum member, I get upgraded. I said, I want to leave tomorrow. What flights do you have going out of Newark? They said, we got two flights. We're going to like 3.30 other at 10.50 p.m. I'm like, 3.30 in the afternoon. How am I going to pack 3.30? You know, it's like now 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, I'll do the 10.50. I was packed. I was gone. I'm here. This is when I see what I look out the window. God bless all of you, and thank you so much. Ari and Jeremy, we love you. We love you. All right. So here's the question that we have. If you had one message that you would want to send to Jews across the world, to non-Jews across the world, as the chief rabbi of talk radio and the special guest of Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem, what would that message be? I want you to know this. If we try to dazzle the nations of the world with our, with our you know, fancy beaches at Tel Aviv, they got us beat because they got Bermuda. If we try to beat them with our, you know, with our fancy car, they got us beat with the Ferraris, only two of them in the whole country. The only, the only, listen to me, the only thing we have is Torah. It's pure and it's holy. That's all we got going for us. You know, the enemy is mightier than us. You know that Iran, they're preparing to attack this nation. And we don't have a chance because Hamas is ready to support them in the south, Hezbollah in the north. Logically speaking, their, their horses and their chariots are greater than ours. But we have a Bible that says this, and this is what you need to use. You need to use scripture. You just, you gotta, you know, when, when you daven, listen to me, guys. When you daven, you go, Baruch, Ato. But you say Hashem's name, you stand straight. Why? Why don't you stay bowed by Hashem's name? Because when you say God's name, literally God fills you up. You don't bow when you're literally speaking on behalf of God. You stand straight. You got to fill your souls with the Torah. These people are hungry. The, the leaders of Jews for Jesus, they're tough folks. But I'll tell you this, the folks in the church, my life is dedicated to bringing them out. And just to plug the outreachjudaism.org. There's a Bible, our Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1 says this. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them, although they have chariots and horses that are greater than yours. Don't be afraid of them. You know why? 
What chance do we got against millions of, tens of millions of evangelicals? There are over a thousand Christian missions that there's in this country alone. What chance do you got? What chance do you got against organizations like Jews for Jesus where they have a budget of more than $30 million annual? That's just one organization. What chance do we have? And this is what Hashem, our God, says. He says, because the God of Israel is with you. The God of Israel is with you. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for coming, Rav Tovia. It's been an honor. It's a pleasure to have me. God bless me. Yes. Albert Einstein said that the greatest error in his life, his greatest regret, was that he did not believe in an expanding universe. You see, it was 1917, he just came out with the theory of relativity, and the entire world believed in a static universe. A static universe that the universe always was and always will be, it's always the same. And as he was studying and investigating, his research was clearly indicating that the universe was expanding. Yet, he would not accept this himself, and he did not share this knowledge with the world. Why was that? Because an expanding universe implies a beginning. And a beginning implies a creator. And that he was not willing to accept. So shortly thereafter, uh, an astronomer from Arizona, another scientist, actually presented the expanding universe model. It was accepted. They were credited with the discovery. And Albert Einstein was not ready to accept the truth that was presented to him at the time. And he died regretting it. You know, throughout all of my travels throughout the United States, I've met tens or hundreds of thousands of people, and my worldview has really began to shift. Because, you know, growing up, I remember the questions that I had. How is it that me, a Jew who's in a Jewish day school getting a Jewish education, how can I be judged compared to some Jew that has no Jewish education, or an Eskimo in, in Alaska, or an Eskimo in Siberia, or an architect in Kazakhstan. Like, where, where's the, what is the gauge? How are we judged? And I never really understood it. I never knew what to make of it until I began meeting these tens and hundreds of thousands of Jews and non-Jews around the world, and it started making sense to me. And I started seeing that every human being is confronted with a certain amount of truth. And they can either be faithful to that truth, no matter what the consequences are, no matter what it means if it would radically change their entire world view, or change the very essence of their lives and, and how they're living, or whether their family would even accept them. If they will accept truth and seek truth, regardless, it is based on that intellectual honesty that we're judged. And really, that's the purpose of the Jewish people in the world, to present that truth, and the world right now is more thirsty for it than ever before. Now, for all those people, in this room who are here in Israel because you know it is true. And for all those people around the world who are on your own quests for truth, let us give you from Tuesday Night Live a bracha, a blessing, that you should seek truth for wherever you go. Not necessarily that you have the brains of Einstein, but that you have the courage of Abraham to seek truth and to be true to whatever you find. Shalom from Jerusalem. This is the opening, opening song for another Arut Sheva show. So this is great. Here we go. Thank <laughs> you.
הקדוש ברוך הוא הקדוש ברוך הוא שלא שם חלקנו כעת לגורלנו ככל המונם שהם משתחווים לחבל בריק מתפללים אל אלו יושיע Oh, 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 oh,